So good afternoon. Uh, just a hey, just just a check that everybody's in the right place. This is the last session of FlowCon. Yeah, everyone here. All right. Um, so I want to keep the momentum going. I know it can be tough, like after lunch, you know, we're you know just an hour and a half from the the end of this thing, and I think everyone wants to go out and. Actually, it's kind of raining outside, so I'm not sure everyone's all that eager to get out. Um, but we got three great talks coming up on kind of um, somewhat orthogonal to each other in, in, in terms of uh, topic, but they all have in common some very interesting models of network traffic. Um, so first up, we've got uh, Satine Chowdhury from Pacific Northwest Lab. He's here representing work that he and one of the members of his research team at PNNL have done in the area of basically mining network traffic, identifying from network traffic the roles, and he'll say more about what that means, of different sorts of systems and services that you can observe in the, in the traffic. And let's get started. So it's all yours. <clears throat> so thank you, Drew. Um, so as Drew said, this is a project uh, that's sponsored out of PNNL's Asymmetric Resilient Cybersecurity Initiative. So the goal of this initiative, or the mandate for this project, is mainly to build graph theoretic models of how machines behave in a cyber enterprise. And one of the sub-goals for the project boils down to identifying how does machines, not just the whole system behaves, but also drilling down to the level of a single system and trying to model its behavior over time. So uh, w one of the common tasks an analyst faces is that whenever we see an LR trace on a machine, he typically has to go back to the machine and look at his pre previous logs. And that, that's often a very time-consuming, tedious process. And there is no, it's not often an automated process. You have to look at months, probably, of data to figure out what that machine does. And then once you have some more information, you'll probably see which other machines this has talked to, and then again repeat all that process with other machines. So my background is in graph analytics. I work on graph mining, graph databases, um, graph-based reasoning, and tr all those things try to work on one central theme, that's cybersecurity. And within cybersecurity, my focus has been mostly on flow analysis. So I started looking at this, all this work initially, saying that, OK, I'm going to be the computer science person and just look at somebody as a domain person, some, somebody from the cyber domain, give me some net flow data sets and work with it. And slowly, I was, I was drawn much deeper into it. So one of my personal quests is that as an analyst looks at the data for a machine or tries to be, under, under, get a sense of its behavior, can we come up with an English description? or summarize what that machine has been doing and elevate the task of the tedious process of digging through these logs and trying to figure out what are the dominant patterns of behavior. So this is what drives this project or this, this particular work is that we want to be able to associate every system in an inter enterprise with the kind of roles it performs. What is the role, what does it mean to say that a system has role A, B, and C? What are the dominant, so in this talk, when I refer to role, this is going to refer to as the dominant features that can be used to summarize the behavior of a machine over time. So some preliminaries, although I feel that uh, after a weeks of flow con, you don't need to go through the slides. But one thing I regret is I'll be using the terms graphs and networks a lot and almost in an interchangeable way. Coming here, I feel like that's a terrible mistake. but. Again, when I say graphs and networks, I'm also almost always referring to networks as a graph model. So without much, much, uh, to spending much time, the only thing I'll say that we make a, a graph is a collection of entities which are linked by some relationships. That those relationships could be directed, they could be undirected. Uh, in this particular work, we focus on directed graphs. Whenever we're looking at the flow data, we model those with the IP addresses typically are hosts becoming nodes in the graph. And the, the dependencies of the communications between two machines gets represented as an edge in the graph. And the direction of the edge t defines who initiated a session to which machine. So 
some of the things, so, and we are also looking at weighted graphs. So the, the, the nodes and the edges in the graph can have weight, and we can use that weight to represent different type of features. Example of edge weights could be we could take uh, the, say, the duration of a flow and use that as a weight on the graph model. We could look at the number of bytes transmitted during a session between two machines, use that as a weight in a graph model. So what is, I kind of touched upon on this before. What you're trying to do here is that for every node in, the net, in a graph, we're trying to summarize his behavior in terms of features. So this work is, uh, is this kind, this, the work on role mining started in the data mining community very recently. This is based on uh, the first publication on this topic came out two years ago in uh, ACMC KDD conference. What, the, what was done there was mainly to, to look at this algorithm and look at some of the social network studies. So first thing we tried to do is that how much of that knowledge, how much of the claims that are done with social networks stands up in the world of flow data. So instead of looking at the features that are pertinent in social networks, we are here combining graph theoretic features as well as flow-based features. So assume that every node has an eight-length feature set. The elements in those feature set could be graph theoretic features such as in-degree, out-degree, centrality, and I'll talk about those, uh, the definitions of those in a moment. And they could also combine other flow-based features such as the distribution of parameters of a flow, the median of a flow associated with the machine. So what is the, what is the, one of the expected payoff for this work is that we see the roles, so, so if, when you talk of resilience, one of the things, goal is that even though we know that part of a system is compromised, we want to keep the rest of the system alive. In order to make that happen, it all, in one in, in sense, it comes down to understanding what are the tasks performed by a system in an enterprise. If the, uh, a system is not playing a critical role, we, in, in, in the time of an attack or in, in the, when uh, the resources are constrained, we can shut that machine down. If, so, the, so here is an example. We, we look at some of the, the applications or, or architectures inside Amazon Cloud. And what, what you often see is that whenever somebody draw, draws a blog, blog diagram of their deployments inside Amazon Cloud, they are almost always reserved to a way of functional diagram. So the quest for us is that can we use a data-driven approach to learn this kind of a functional diagram of an enterprise? So I'll get in, get in, get in, getting into the algorithm. So as I said, that for every node in the graph, we compute a set of graph theoretic features. Uh, we, we look at the triangle, triangles associated with every node, how many connections come into that node, how many outbound connections are happening from a node, and in the vic vicinity of a node, are there sort of triangles forming so that a node A communicates to B and C, and B and C also have communications going on between themselves. What is the rank of that node? How important is that node in the network? If you go, went ahead and removed that node, will the network collapse as a consequence of that? F they look at flow-based flow features. So what, are, what is the distribution? Is this node usually participating in very high volume communications? Does it look, uh, are the flows from the in and out of this node usually long or short? Are they very frequent? Those are the features we're trying to capture under the flow-based features. So what you do after that, in, in short, is we construct a matrix. Basically, we make up a table where the number of rows in the table equals the number of IP addresses or hosts in the system or the, in, the, in the network. And the number of columns are the number of features that we have combined from this graph as well as from flow analysis. So then, then we use an algorithm called non-negative matrix factorization. Um, this is conceptually very similar to clustering, except with some subtle differences. And then what it does is that it gives us two So, so this algorithm gives us two kind of outputs. First, it gives us a number of role definitions. The roles are defined in terms of strength of these features. So if you look at this, the, the, the picture on the left, each point on the x-axis defines a feature. The height of the columns indicates the strength of that feature for that particular role. So what you could come back and say is that, let's say if feature number two was in triangles, feature number four was inflow duration, so you could come back and say role A could be defined as 
machines which have a lot of incoming connections, and they also ha seem to have uh, high incoming session durations. Similarly, we could say, if you think about its role, the, the features four and five being something, say, with a number of out triangles, or the duration of the sessions, the outbound sessions, you could say role C is defined as machines which has a lot of outbound connections, and they're pretty long. I'm just making up those role definitions, but the point is that the output from the algorithm is a distribution of roles which are defined in terms of the features we're identifying. So one of the goal is that if we can restrict ourselves to features which are pretty intuitive, then we can come back and start putting machines into buckets in a way that they make sense to us. So we, we, we can come up with some sort of a real life, instead of saying that here is a machine and it can be expressed as an abstract vector in a 128 dimension space, we want to be able to say, okay, here is a machine, I'm calling it role A because it behaves in this way. And this way is something in terms of features that we usually understand and care about. The other thing you also get back from this algorithm is that obviously as soon as you have the role distribution, we can start assigning each node in the network to one of these roles. And then obviously it gives, back, gives us back a role distribution. So I skipped a little bit early. So here are some, so I wanted to share some example of graph theoretic features. So when I talk of triangles, this is an example of a triangle looks like. So if A was a, a node we're talking about, and if it has got a lot of inbound connections, the, by, the, by definition, it increases the number of in triangles. If A was a node that had a lot of outbound connections to many hosts, that will result as the out triangle feature being very high. A through triangle means A receives a lot of requests from somebody and forwards a lot of requests to somebody else. This could be something like a, a web server that gets a lot of requests from the clients and then possibly talks to a database server to serve the request back. A, a cycle results when A is talking to machines like could be two other machines on, on the, the lower half of the triangle, but the lower half of the triangle, they also seem to have kind of a communication between themselves. Normally we don't see this, but in, in cases like botnets, this would be a very common structure where you see a strong community kind of structure emerging in a network. Okay, core, core kind of, so the core the property that you're seeing in the lower picture that with this blue, yellow, and uh, red dots basically says, is, the, is a machine really a peri, a per, playing a peripheral role in the whole enterprise? This could be like our handheld devices that just connects to a router we browse for some time and then go away. It doesn't matter if that machine failed or if that machine went away. On the other hand, so that those, are those, those would be the ones on the blue core. So think of it like an, as an onion. You're taking off the shells of the, you're putting all the nodes in the network in different shells. And you're progressively removing those shells and what you find in the innermost is that the closely connected core. This, this sort of analysis is very, uh, relevant for looking at internet backbone structure. So you can see, the, see routers or machines which, are, um, which, are, which could be connected to ISPs, but if they went down, it would not disrupt the whole functioning of the internet. On the other hand, the red ones are the ones which plays a very central role in keeping the whole internet up and running. So here is an example of a K-Core feature. So we, could take, we took uh, one of the event log data sets from PNNL and we try to progressively find which ones are the, actually at the core of the network. So we applied different algorithms, take the original network, did some transformation, look, got rid of the, some of the noisy behavior. We still found that there's a, like a hairball on the top right. We did more filtering, and then this is, we found sort of a core structure that performs, that is central to the operation of the whole network. So this, these are all the, diff, all the features we are trying to pack in in that matrix. These are the features that tells us something, what, what defines the existence of a node in a network. So once you have an algorithm like that working, there are two main, main analysis objectives. One is the classification. So, given a, so we could train on a historical data set, and then tomorrow when you get a new data set or new data from the same enterprise, we can try classifying each of the IP addresses or hosts into one of those roles. So the objective there could be saying, okay, well, did somebody change their role? And I'll show you some example of that. 
the, so nodes could swap roles in multiple ways. One, one reason nodes could, could swap roles is because they are not doing the same thing as they're doing yesterday. Node could swap roles in another way that our training was not done on a good data set. And, and so this is a work in progress, and I'll share some of the challenges we're facing right now. The other objective is that, well, so this is where you can see how many nodes are swapping roles. If you did the training right, we shouldn't see much swapping when the behavior of the enterprise is not changing. In one case, we saw, well, we trained on a normal data set, and then we took a, a DDoS simulation on the same system, and then ran those algorithms, and we suddenly see a huge amount of shift in the number of roles, in the, in the nodes swapping roles. That's because we suddenly see behavior that we have not trained with. <clears throat> so in this case, I'll, I'll share some experiment, experimental analysis we have done from a data set we got from University of New Brunswick. So this is a test setup they have over there. Um, all the subnets you're seeing on the, on the left, they comprise about 150 to 200 machines. These are mostly workstations used by the students. They also have, they have a score switch in the middle, and they have a couple of a few servers on, that's described on the top right. And then they also had, uh, from the other subnet that you're seeing on the top, uh, sorry, the bottom right, this is where they had perform different type of attacks on the, in this infrastructure. In the data set, we also had significant amount of traffic going to the internet. So what you saw there is that one, so there are two ways we can look at this. One way is visual. It's very easy for us to take a, a data set, color each of the nodes in the graph with, with the roles, and see if it makes sense. So first thing is that we're, we, we seem to be getting this right to a good degree. So we took, uh, this is from a, uh, again from our PNNL data set. PNNL has about five to 6,000 machines. We're surprised that this algorithm got the, the distribution between the clients versus servers almost right. It didn't get it exactly right, but, but the degree to which it got, it was very surprising that the algorithm could figure things out itself. The problem becomes is that there are a lot of roles, a lot of machines that gets classified in the wrong bucket. And that's where the challenge becomes is that it's easy to get to 80% accuracy, but as you try to push from 80% to any higher, that's where the, the difficulties come in. So this is the result, some analysis from the University of New Brunswick data set. So we try to, instead of t learning one role that defines the normal activity, and then applying that role definition on different type of different days, like one day we had an insider inf infiltration attack simulation. One day we had a HTTP DOS simulation where it was just one machine talking to another machine, opening an HTTP session and keeping it, holding it there. The other day it was more like a distributed denial of service attack. So one, what, what I'm, we're presenting here is that we took each of these days and tried to learn the roles. What is interesting is that for, for normal activity, there are two roles that can pretty much define the, the network behavior. So the, the, those are like where you're seeing the K code rank being high and the page rank being sort of high. We saw that, that some of the NAT servers got classified into that role. The, the one where you're seeing the true triangle being very high, the web server that got a lot of requests from clients and was talking to a database server got put in the role. The problem was that the other two role definitions really didn't have much definitive about those. This sort of seems some, some random. So that's a challenge is that, so as part of this algorithm, we have also found a way to learn the number of automatic number, automatically learn the number of optimum roles. What that means is that we are using the minimum description link principle to say, what is the right number of roles? If you're, if you're familiar with like something like a k-means clustering, you have to specify how many clusters you specify on this, to partition the data. Here, we don't have to do those things. We can say, go first, learn, look at the diversity in the data, and try to find the optimum balance between different type of groups. So in this case, we did specify just for uniformity of analysis. On the other days, during the attack days, we could see that it was all, always right in pick, picking up the attack machine and see, the, if you look at the HTTP DOS, that's on the top, bottom right, it was putting the attack machine into the role where it has uh, the outflow duration being very high. 
what was baffling was that, well, so, okay, you got the attacker machine in the right bucket. You got the one that has a high outflow duration. Then we should see, expect to see something on the inverse uh, other side as well. So the machine who, who was getting a lot of inflow with high duration should get another role. So then we got confused, why isn't that happening? And then we found out that as part of the data, the, the machine which was attacked, for some time it did have very high inflow duration, but other times its inflow duration was pretty random and it was pretty small. So its, its, its inflow duration was almost like a, had two peaks in the distribution and, and the algorithm didn't classify it in a, in a separate category. So this kind of defensive struggle is that we, we're trying to make this what, we're trying to take an algorithm that seems pretty powerful, but make, make this in a production environment. We found, already found that the th assumption that holds up very well in social networks does not hold up at all for, for the cyber scenarios. So the other thing is, is that what you're doing, this, this analysis is very sensitive to how we build the graph from the data. How long should we look at the window? Because we're, all you're doing is we're taking the flow data, doing aggregation. If two machines are talking between themselves, no matter what protocol they have been talking about, we basically are trying to, we are reducing that, summarizing that information in terms of one weight. Maybe we should get rid of the, of, of the protocols or the communications that are not very, um, very informative. The other, other interesting thing is, is that how do we get the right, uh, how do you build sort of a library of roles? So the, here's the challenge between overtuning, overlearning, and too general of a role definition. So one of the ways we feel that our problems could be solved is that if we can could find a good benchmark data set, we could look at some of the data sets we have in-house, we could look at some of the flow data sets available in open, but again, the, the results of the studies vary widely. So one of the things I would like to hear from you is that if you have suggestions on benchmark data sets, that you could experiment with. If you have any suggestions about uh, what are the meaningful features to look at, what are some of the use cases you think this work could drive, that would be fascinating for us. So conclusions and future work, our end goal is again to come up with a library of role definitions that we can use sort of to classify machines in, uh, in an enterprise, detect when they swap roles, and be able to explain why they're doing it. Our, we are also looking at different tuning knobs for learning these roles, and that's what is captured by the diversity of sparsity constraints. We can say, define your roles so that you are putting machines in using as um, non-overlapping features as possible. So that has one implication versus the sparsity constraint that says, just use the most of the dominant features, and even though they're overlapping, don't worry about them. We'll just pick the, pick, pick the role assignments by by the, by the distance from a node versus a role. So this, these are the various tuning knobs, but the challenge still remains intact, is that how do you make this work, and is this, can, can, can this be really impactful for cybersecurity? So questions from you. Looks like we have time for one question. Unfortunately, so time for one question or two very quick ones. I, th I think you said your classification accuracy was 80%. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Oh, does that mean I have time to ask a question? Oh, no, that was my question. All right. Um, <laughs> so you're, you mentioned that, you, that it, it's highly dependent on how you summarize the types of flows. And um, I've given a little bit of thought to this type of thing, and I really think that that depends. You, you have to have at least you know, like some arrow of direction that says what that role counts for. And honestly, take that into account when you summarize the data, right? So if you're looking for roles that people are doing, do it at people scale, like do the aggregations at people scale, right? You're not gonna look at milliseconds at that point. If you're looking at roles that machines are doing when they talk to each other and they go quickly, right? Then yeah, look down onto millisecond scale because that's the level at which those important things happen. But then, of course, you get the idea that now you have two different ways of building graphs out of this thing, and so you've basically just doubled your problem in that case. So, I, but, but I really think that in terms of the types of roles, in gran, like the granularity that you look at depends on the temporal, like, li, like the time it takes for the events, for the, for the roles to have meaning in that case. 
But and I think that's a great suggestion that I understand. So what you're saying is, if you're uh, really looking for human behavior, one option would be to look at maybe HTTP traffic and expand to the point where it sort of manifests itself enough in the data so it stands out by its own strength. Well, yeah, but hum, like for human activity, if it's, a, if it's a role involving humans, for machine activity, if it's a role involving machines. Yeah, okay. Thank you.